Okay, okay. I want to introduce our guest today, and uh, the speaker is called Steve Schledover, comes from Berkeley, USA, and uh, I've been working a very, in this field, very well known project called the PASS project that was started uh, approximately at the same time as the European project called Prometheus. And uh, that was around 86, 87. So uh, it's a long uh, time since then, and uh, more or less 25 years of experience that we can get to know today. Right. So thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I should say that this is the second talk in the colloquium series. And uh, if we get a head start here by two famous researchers from Berkeley. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, pleased to be here to talk to you about the progress that has happened in leading towards automated driving. Uh, this is something that's received more public attention in the last few years after Google made their announcement that they were doing automated driving on public roadways. I'll start by a little bit of history. This goes way back. There's a long history of thinking and of work on this topic area and then get into some definitions of concepts because it turns out different people mean different things when they talk about automated driving and it can sometimes be very confusing. I'll talk about the distinctions between partial automation and full automation of the driving function and important distinctions about whether the vehicles are driven in mixed traffic in general traffic lanes or whether they are segregated in special purpose lanes for automated vehicles. And then I'll talk about some of the intermediate developments that lead towards the future automated driving that we've been working on in the last few years at PATH. And if time permits, then we'll talk at the end about some of the technical and institutional challenges that still need to be met. So at least in the US, our history goes back to 1939. Uh, when there was a World's Fair in New York, General Motors had an exhibit called Futurama, talking about what the future would look like 25 years later. Uh, GM actually did technical work during the 1950s uh, in collaboration with RCA, Radio Corporation of America, in developing some of the technology. And then they had another exhibit in 1964 at another World's Fair, and I'll show you some videos of that. After that, there was research by Professor Fenton at Ohio State University during the 60s and 70s, and then kind of a gap before the PATH program got started in 1986. We've been working on the topic ever since then. Uh, the most intensive work happened during the period of 1994 to 98, when there was a National Automated Highway System Consortium, and I'll show you some videos from that as well. Uh, more recently, we've done work on automated buses and trucks, and in parentheses here, I put the DARPA challenges, which I think represent a different approach towards vehicle automation. More recently, we've done some automated truck platoons, and of course, Google has been doing their work in recent years as well. Going back to 39, 1960s Express Motorway. Automatic radio control. Nineteen thirty nine. Uh, then in the nineteen fifties, GM developed this concept car. This kind of an obsolete centralized control way of thinking about it. Uh, notice open road with no other traffic around. Very much of an aircraft-oriented analogy. It's gas turbine-powered vehicle. Complete with 1950s-style music. And that's a real vehicle. Uh, GM still has that test vehicle. They brought it to our demonstration in 1997. And a 1960s version. Travel routes remarkably safe, swift, and efficient. Powering terminals serve sections of the city. Make public transit. 
transportation more convenient, provide ample space for private cars, and from a lower level, covered moving walks radiate to shopping areas that are now truly marketplaces of the world. This was the climax of the 64 Futurama ride. This was a ride that you could take, lasted about 15 minutes, showed several different visions of what the future would be 25 years hence. So this should have happened by 1990. Um, this is now 1977. Well, let's not get into all the details, but uh, it's an example of the types of visions that have been developed and some of the technology that's been developed in the past. Our work uh, included a demonstration in 1997, vehicles driving automatically along a highway lane. In this case, they're at a gap of five and a half meters, running at uh, about 100 kilometers per hour. This demonstration included lane changes and vehicles entering and exiting the platoon. Here we're coming up a grade. Uh, the, they stay really tightly coupled together, so when you're sitting in one of those cars, it feels like the car in front of you is pulling you up the grade. Um, we took close to a thousand people for demonstration rides in those vehicles. In 2000, we did the automated merging. Uh, this is a case where the vehicles are in wireless communication with each other. They are not within sensor field of view of each other, though. So when that car comes in from the side, its radar can't see the other cars. They know where they are in terms of their positioning along the test track, and they communicate that information among each other so that the two cars in the main lane open up a gap to allow the third car to get in. That's an example of coordinated operation through communication, which you can't do if you only have sensors. Uh, you have to have the active coordination through communication in order to do something like that. Can I ask a question? Yeah? What, what kind of positioning system do you have? In that case, well, okay, it's a little complicated to explain. In that case, we have magnets embedded in the track, and we have a database so that each vehicle knows where it is relative to those magnets. So there's an absolute positioning reference. And then they're communicating using Wi-Fi. Uh, there are a variety of ways of doing that, but that's the, the way we were doing it in that demonstration. Uh, con concepts. There are many different concepts for automated driving, but the first thing we have to keep in mind, this is not an end in itself. It's a tool for solving transportation problems. Uh, the institute I work in is an institute of transportation studies, so it's not technology for the sake of technology. It's technology to try to solve traffic problems alleviating congestion, reducing energy use and emissions, improving safety, and if we can do something that'll be widely used, then we have a larger impact in all of those categories. And I don't have time to talk about the details under each of those categories, but the way that we've approached this in our work is trying to increase the highway capacity because the original motivation for getting our work started 25 years ago is that the state of California could not continue to build more highways in order to deal with the traffic congestion, yet our population keeps growing, the economy keeps growing, traffic keeps getting worse, but our highway infrastructure does not grow. And if we can use the electronic technology to get more traffic per hour through each lane, we've helped deal a lot with the congestion problem. But in order to get there, there are several things we had to do. First, operate the automated vehicles physically separated from the non-automated vehicles. Because once you mix them up, the non-automated vehicles mess up the automated vehicles and make it impossible to get the benefits. Second one was fully automate the vehicle driving, remover, removing the driver from the control loop. Because if you let the driver get involved, the driver's going to mess it up. Driver is going to be subject to the same limitations that happen in today's traffic. And then finally, we want to use the best real-time information that we can get about the driving environment based on communication and coordination among the vehicles 
and between the vehicles and the infrastructure. If each vehicle has the most complete information about what all the other vehicles are doing and information from the infrastructure that it can't sense itself, it'll do much better. So by that, these are not autonomous vehicles. These are coordinated, automated vehicles. And I try to make the distinction here. Level of automation on the vertical axis, degree of cooperation horizontally, so we can have warnings to help driver be safer, control assistance to help the driver uh, control the vehicle motion, up to full automation of driving. Autonomy is the opposite of cooperation. Autonomy means independence. So we say at the left we have high autonomy, at the right we have low autonomy. Today we have many vehicles on the market that have collision warning systems. They are totally autonomous, no cooperation involved. We have autonomous adaptive cruise control. It's available on vehicles today. And the military in particular has done a lot of work on autonomous unmanned vehicles. That's also the part of the axis where Google is doing their work these days. We can have intelligent speed adaptation, which involves some communication between the vehicles and the infrastructure. We have cooperative collision warning systems, low level of automation, but very high level of cooperation. And in the US, there's a great deal of attention going into that in a project called the Safety Pilot, where collision warnings are being done entirely based on communication and cooperation without sensors on the vehicles. Cooperative adaptive cruise control is adaptive cruise control augmented with vehicle to vehicle communication. And then we can get to the highly automated systems where we have both high cooperation and high automation. But there are many different dimensions to this space that we have to think about. So let me talk a little bit about why cooperation and why not autonomy. By having cooperation among the vehicles, we can compensate for the limitations of sensors. And there are lots of problems with sensors when you put them on vehicles in terms of the range, having line of sight, uh, having uncertainties about what that sensor data really means. All of that means the sensors have to be filtered a lot and that introduces lags. So now the outputs you get from your sensor can be significantly delayed from what's really happening in the environment. We want to be able to get additional information from other vehicles that you can't get from remote sensors. A sensor on my vehicle cannot tell me the acceleration of a vehicle in front of me. And if you're using a laser radar, it can't even tell me the speed of the vehicle in front. It may be able to tell me the distance, but you have to differentiate it to get the speed. And once you've done the filtering, it really slows down your data. Um, fault conditions. A vehicle in front has a major fault. You can't sense that in the following vehicle. But if that vehicle can communicate that fault to you, you can respond much more quickly. Uh, this enables us to get advanced alerts about hazards in the roadway or about what a vehicle is going to do so that you can respond to it uh, far enough in advance. And finally, you want some verification that other vehicles have been seen. Just like drivers making eye contact with other drivers, did that driver see me so that I can go? Well, vehicles ought to be able to do the same thing. They can do it by wireless communication. They can't do it by autonomous sensing. And finally, this also enables system level coordination and management. So you can have a well integrated system to serve traffic purposes. Now, that's at the full automation level, but there are many degrees of automation below that. Um, and there's a lot of discussion going on right now about different levels of driving automation. We can have systems that supplement the driver capabilities, so the driver is still doing some of the driving, the system is helping, or systems that replace the driver. And when we're supplementing the driver capabilities, we can have collision warning systems, we can have control assistance systems, and those are all on the market. With full automation, we eliminate the problems caused by the drivers, and we eliminate the inconsistencies and the uncertainties in response, so we know what the other system is doing. We can get much higher utilization of that roadway infrastructure. The infrastructure is very expensive. Moore's law doesn't apply to steel and concrete, so it's going to keep getting more expensive. It's not going to get cheaper. So we can get higher utilization of that roadway infrastructure. If we can track vehicles in the lane within centimeters, the lane width only needs to be centimeters wider than the vehicle. It doesn't need to be twice the width of the vehicle. And if we can get the vehicles following closely together and safely, we can get a lot more vehicles per lane per hour through that infrastructure. We could eliminate the crashes that are caused by drivers, and approximately 95% of the crashes that happen today are caused by something that the driver did wrong. Only about 5% are associated with vehicle failures. 
we can save fuel and emissions by first of all smoothing out the traffic flow transients and reducing aerodynamic drag by getting vehicles close together. When we get stuck in stop and go traffic these days, you accelerate, you decelerate, you accelerate, you decelerate. That's all because of the dynamics of driver's car following behavior. If the driver's not doing the car following, we can get rid of that and we can keep that traffic flowing more smoothly. Finally, we think the first deployment opportunities are likely with buses and trucks before we get to passenger cars. It's an advantage for drivers. Uh, first of all, if you've got full automation, the driver doesn't have to worry about what's the system going to do, what do I need to do. The driver doesn't need to do anything, it's very clear. It's no longer stressful. You don't have to worry about what that other idiot in the car in the next lane is going to be doing. Is he about to cut me off? And now you can actually have the driver do all these other things that drivers like to do and often do do today, but it creates a lot of safety problems when drivers do all of these non-driving tasks. If you have a safe automated system, then the driver is indeed free to do those things without causing safety problems. But how do we get there? And that's one of the big challenges. How do we make the steps to go from today's driving environment to a future automated driving environment? There are two fundamentally different approaches to that. One is the gradual evolution with increasing automation capabilities on the vehicle. The other is separate implementation of automated driving in restricted environments. So if we look at the approach that involves evolution with increasingly automated capabilities, we start with the collision warning and control assistance systems that are on the market today and that people are starting to make good use of. Uh, that way the technology can increase can imp in capabilities, the costs can come down, you can get manufacturing economies of scale, and all the things can work nicely technologically. But there's a really serious human factors challenge associated with it. As you start taking more of those driving responsibilities away from the driver, the driver gets disengaged from the driving task. And at some point, the system can't handle the problem, the driver is texting or doing something else, now you've got to crash. There's no solution to that yet. The second of these is the separate implementation in restricted environments. So here you simplify the technical challenges by making that environment more well controlled. You only have vehicles that are properly equipped operating in that environment. They're communicating with each other. Then they can verify they're in proper working order. They can negotiate their maneuvers successfully. You reduce the randomness of that environment greatly. This is something you can start with buses on a busway, for example, or trucks on a dedicated truck lane. Here, though, we have the institutional and economic challenge of how we develop those separate dedicated roadways. And that's one of the reasons we like to start with buses and trucks, because in some cases they have their own dedicated roadways already. So we need to give some attention to those human factors challenges because that evolutionary technology advancing uh, approach is kind of seductive and seems like it's a way that has, is very attractive. But I'd like to explain why it's so difficult. First of all, you've got a driver workload issue. If you have partial automation of the vehicle control, the driver is no longer responsible for controlling the vehicle and is going to do something else. You know, there's no way you can force a driver to pay attention if they don't need to pay attention. And this is likely to happen as soon as you combine adaptive cruise control with lane keeping. Situational awareness is another aspect of this. If the driver tunes out, is not paying attention to what's going on in the road environment, they don't understand the road hazards they might be facing, especially if the automation is doing most of the driving. But that leads to complacency. Because now, if the automated system works 99% of the time, and the driver doesn't have to do very much, the driver is going to assume it's 100% of the time. And then at the time when something bad happens that the system can't respond to, the driver is not available to intervene. The driver is doing something else. And finally, if the driver doesn't have to drive, they're going to forget their higher driving skills. So we look at this with the system capability in the one axis, and the driver responsibility the other axis, fully automated system is up there. Today's completely unaided driving is down there. With warning systems, we provided a very low level of automation. The driver is still doing almost everything. With adaptive cruise control, we've moved a little bit further. It's taking a little more of the driving, but the driver still has a lot of responsibility. 
And there's that temptation to think we can just march up that dotted line, gradually adding more and more responsibilities to the automated system. And I'm concerned that when we get into those regions, you have this loss of vigilance. The driver's not paying attention anymore. And I'm worried that com combination of adaptive cruise control and lane keeping is going to get us into that region where the driver is not paying attention. We'll see as those systems get on the market. There are some car makers who are introducing systems that do that. And uh, once enough of them are on the market, we'll see what happens with the crash statistics. There are really very few of them available right now, so I don't think we know the answer. Uh, there's also quite a bit of research being done. Uh, General Motors did some research within the past year on a test track where they gave drivers vehicles that had both the lane keeping and the speed control and let them drive for about an hour. And very quickly, those drivers started doing other things, not paying attention to the driving environment. So when a hazard was introduced on the test track, it took the drivers a really long time to respond to it and to act safely. So that, there's a warning sign there that there's already some experimental evidence that drivers do uh, lose attention to the driving task if they're not required to be engaged in it continuously. So let's go on to mixed traffic and dedicated lanes. Uh, here again, there are a couple of different approaches to implementing the driving automation. We can have the automated and the manual vehicles coexisting in the same roadway lane, or we can segregate them. So if they're in the same lane, it's very nice you don't need to build separate infrastructure. You can just use the infrastructure you have today. But there's some really huge technological challenges that have to be faced in order to be able to deal with the bad drivers on the road right now. And the system really has to handle the worst driver doing the stupidest illegal thing possible on the road, because otherwise they're going to crash. You're not going to get benefits in congestion or energy savings or emissions, because the bad driving behaviors of the other drivers are going to disrupt the traffic enough that the automated vehicles can't gain those benefits. And I think it's really questionable whether we're going to see safety benefits if we do it that way. If we segregate the automated vehicles from the manual, now we have the problem that we need a new infrastructure. We've got to physically protect the automated vehicles from the bad drivers. That simplifies the technology so the automation technology doesn't have to deal with all those bad drivers. And now we can start getting the congestion and the energy and the emissions benefits, as well as the safety benefits. So why is this mixed traffic automation so hard? Uh, why do I think it's so impractical. Well, first of all, bad drivers. You can't really design an automation system based on those worst case conditions because your vehicle would never move. But at the same time, you can't avoid doing it because if you're going to have the vehicle be safe, it has to be able to respond to just about anything that's going to happen out there on the road. Some people intentionally try to create crashes. We have a phenomenon in the U.S. known as suicide by 18-wheeler people will deliberately drive into the path of a heavy truck so that their car gets hit and they get killed. Uh, it's traumatic for the truck drivers, but it, it does happen. Um, the sensors, the signal processing, the control systems on those vehicles are going to have to be better than the average experienced driver, the experienced driver who's relatively safe. But even getting an automated system to the level of a novice driver is a huge technological problem. You have to be able to program the protocols for every possible scenario that's going to arise, including ones that are ethically untenable, uh, scenarios where somebody's going to get killed and your software has to decide who's going to get killed. And again, you can't improve capacity or save energy by doing it that way. If we have the lane separated, now you're separated from the bad driving behaviors. You can have consistent driving protocols for all the vehicles and you can operate the vehicles closer together to get both capacity and drag benefits. So let's look at some of those intermediate developments. Um, I'll talk about some work on cooperative adaptive cruise control, on transit bus precision docking, and heavy truck platooning. These are some of the technological developments that we think are likely to come into, uh, into public use before some of the other capabilities. So the cooperative ACC adds vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication to commercially available ACC, enables higher performance of the adaptive cruise control, but the driver is still responsible for steering the vehicle. With the bus precision docking, we get a bus to operate more like a railroad train. Uh, question? Yes. Is the cooperative ACC on the market? 
No. No, Cooperative ACC is not on the market today. Uh, there's no agreement yet on the standardization for the messages that need to be exchanged between the vehicles, and there hasn't yet been any experimentation with a heterogeneous mix of vehicles. Uh, we want to get to that. That's something that's coming up in our research very soon, uh, we expect. Um, with the buses, you have the opportunity to have both the vehicle and the infrastructure under the same management. You can have a, a bus operating company responsible for the busway and for the bus driving. The driver is still responsible for speed control. With the heavy truck platooning, there's a big economic incentive based on drag reduction because trucks can save a lot of fuel. So that helps to drive the market. And in many cases in the U.S., we're looking at the possibility of building dedicated truck lanes to separate the trucks from the cars anyway. If we can get the dedicated truck lane implementation, then this heavy truck platooning uh, becomes relatively straightforward. So. Let's start with the cooperative ACC. Whoops. I've got to find the cursor here to. There, there it is, to click on that. We're going to show four different gaps. The cooperative ACC enables. Oh, that's not going to play. Uh, there we go. OK. Uh, with the cooperative ACC, we can run at gaps from 1.1 second, the upper left down to 0 0.6 seconds in the lower right. A 1.1 seconds happened to be the minimum gap that was available with the commercially available ACC that we started with. But by adding that vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle cooperation, we made it possible to drive at those intermediate gaps all the way down to 0 0.6. And then we did an experiment with drivers from the general public to determine what their preferences were for use of the system at those different gaps. Then we want to show a difference in the response to a lead vehicle braking maneuver here. The upper video is the commercially available autonomous ACC. The lower one is the cooperative ACC, both in this case operating at the 1.1 second gap. The lead car is going to put his brakes on right about now. The brake lights just went on. Look at how the gap changes in the normal ACC in the upper one. Then he reaccelerates up to speed. We see this big difference in the gap getting shorter and then the gap getting longer because the ACC response is relatively slow and loose. The cooperative ACC response is much tighter. That's better for traffic flow dynamics, helps reduce stop and go problems in traffic, but it also makes the driver of the cooperative system comfortable driving at those shorter gaps. And indeed the test data showed this from our experiments with 16 drivers from the general public. When they drove the commercially available autonomous ACC, this was the distribution of their selections of gap settings between 1.1 and 2.2 seconds. When we gave them the cooperative system to drive, those preferences shifted very strongly towards the shorter gaps, the 0 0.6 and 0 0.7 seconds, because the response of the system is so much tighter. On average, it represented 45% of the gaps that they chose with the autonomous ACC. Yeah, question. So the drivers were aware that this one is corporate, this other one not? Yes, and yes. Were, and it was explained to them that they could set it lower? Or what with they were given the, uh, they weren't given any of the numerical values, but they had the opportunity to choose the gap just using a button on the instrument panel. The No, we measured this over the entire time that they were driving and then recorded what the distribution was over that time. So for, there's a learning process and we have the data for each trip along the way. They started off at the longer gaps and as they got comfortable with the system then they tended to go towards the shorter gaps. But these were the averages across all of their driving. So if we just looked at what they did towards the end of the experiment, it would be shifted even more towards the shorter gaps than, than what we're showing here. But it's more than a factor of two right now on the mean values between the cooperative and the autonomous system. When we put that into a traffic simulation, <coughs> what that means is we start at a typical highway traffic flow of about 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane. If all of the drivers had the cooperative ACC and they chose the gap settings that they actually chose in our experiment, we'd get to almost 4,000 vehicles per hour per lane because the average gap selection was so much lower. If we add, had the rest of the vehicles in the traffic stream that didn't have the ACC, but just have the radio system that lets them communicate their movements so that the cooperative ACC can follow them, 
those are called vehicle awareness devices in the uh, safety pilot program, we can get a faster growth. That's what the upper part of that plot is in the, the red, show the faster growth in traffic flow volume as the market penetration of cooperative ACC increases. That's a strong motivation from a public policy perspective to be able to get this on the market because it helps improve traffic flow and traffic hi highway capacity. From a private sector perspective, it makes the ACC a lot more attractive to the user because they're less likely to get others cutting in front of them when they're operating at the shorter gaps. And is there a question? The position and their speed and any anomalies in their behavior. Yeah, but it's more speed than, that it's more important than position. The speed is the most important data there. Uh, yes? In the simulation, were there any assumptions about the speed of the vehicles on the axis? Uh, this was just at a normal highway operation, a highway speed uh, around 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, so uh, there was a distribution of drivers' preferred speeds around that mean value. But uh, yeah, there was nothing, uh, nothing terribly sensitive to speed in that. So now, deployment staging is one of these big challenges. What kind of sequence do we go through to get to a future where we would have more automated driving? If we add this vehicle to infrastructure cooperation element, cooperative system element, now we have to have some kind of public-private cooperation because the roadways and the public infrastructure, public agencies, the vehicles are private. So that adds some institutional complexity but if we have bus rapid transit buses doing this, we now have vehicles and infrastructure under the same operation. I already mentioned the trucks having an advantage, but I think passenger cars and van pools may become later. So let's look at some of the buses. Um, this is an example of precision docking. Um, you see the video going in the upper right. This was on a test in uh, San Diego in 2003. The bus is being steered automatically. It's going around the line of parked cars and pulling up to the bus stop. Uh, and it does that repeatedly with a steering accuracy of about one centimeter. And the idea of having the one centimeter accuracy is that when it stops, you could get a wheelchair rolling on and off the bus without having to deploy a ramp. It gives you the type of accuracy you would have in an urban metro system, so the quality of service to the passengers is higher. And, uh, my colleague in that video is going to do something that we don't recommend in public operation, but he's showing off here that we also have the bus under automatic speed control. Uh, so this is a case where that bus is being driven completely automated. And we'll see here in the video how accurately it comes up to the dock. Uh, there's that centimeter gap between the edge of the bus and the loading platform. Now, we also have to do that in public environment. This is an experiment in the lower left that we did on a public street in the Bay Area. And we had lots of complexities when we get into public streets. You'll see the bus did a little jiggle there. It had to do that so that the mirror would not hit the pole that's right next to the street. So in order to get that bus to pull up to the curb really accurately, we had to deal with imperfections in the local environment. Rough pavement, you see a noticeable slant, the crown on the road. So there are lots of practical issues that we've also had to deal with in trying to make that function work. Heavy trucks this is a really interesting opportunity for automation because we can run them very close together and save a lot of fuel. So we've driven them at highway speed at a gap of three meters, it saves between 10 and 15 percent of the energy consumption on the trucks. And since fuel is the biggest operating expense for trucks, that's a really big deal. Uh, if we could run three truck cooperative automated platoons of trucks, we could double the capacity of a dedicated truck lane. And that means you can handle a very high volume of trucks in just a single lane. Uh, and one of our deployment studies showed how you could dramatically reduce the cost of a truck-only facility that way. When we did a three-truck platoon, we could show the gap variations between the trucks quite small. Uh, 22 centimeters between the first and the second truck an RMS of 25 centimeters between the second truck and the third truck. So that it requires some very good control engineering to maintain that type of accurate gap following. This is an example from 2003. Oh, that's really pixelated. Sorry about the quality of the video. Uh, this is running on a former aircraft runway. Um, 
and we have three, four, and six meter gaps in these videos, which is what we were doing. Here's what it looks like at a three meter gap from the following truck when you're right behind the lead truck. In this case, our driver is doing the steering. In a real system, you would have to have that steering automated as well. It's very stressful for a driver trying to control that steering when he can't see the road ahead. All he can see is the back of the preceding truck. Uh, during these experiments, we made some very careful fuel consumption measurements, which I'll show on a subsequent slide. Uh, and we also made emissions measurements. Uh, one of the trailers was equipped with full <coughs> emissions monitoring equipment. So there's some data on that, but the data on emissions is not really very revealing. It's, there's a lot of noise in that data, so we can't really draw strong conclusions about that. And here you'll see what the three meter gap looks like when you see it from the side. You notice there's a reflector at the bottom of the first trailer. That is needed to make sure that the radar and the LIDAR sensors on the following truck are always measuring the distance to the back of the trailer. Without that reflector there, sometimes they measure the distance to the rear axle. Well, that's a difference of a couple of meters. And if you're following at a three meter gap, you don't want to have a couple of meter error in which part of the truck your sensor is reflecting off of. Uh, just uh, about a year and a half ago, we did this with a three-truck platoon. Three trucks gets a lot more complicated than two trucks. Uh, the dynamics are considerably more challenging. Uh, this was on a section of highway in Nevada uh, that we actually had to close to public traffic while we were doing the experiments. And we made some emission additional measurements of uh, the, uh, the fuel savings while we were running in the three-truck platoon. We also did some maneuvering, trucks joining the platoon and leaving the platoon, uh, speed changes and going up and down grades. And again, you can see the reflector. I believe this test run was at six meters. Uh, we later did four meters, but our video person wasn't there when we got things working well enough to do that at a four meter gap. Uh, let's move on. So fuel savings, this is from the 2003 experiments. The front truck, saves between 5 and 10 percent of the fuel, depending on the gap. The following truck can save between 10 and 15 percent of the fuel. Those large dots are the direct measurements of fuel consumption out on the test track. The small dots are based on some wind tunnel experiments with scale models that represented a different shape of truck uh, that showed somewhat greater opportunities for savings if they could get really close together. But that's big money if that can be implemented. Um, and again, we, on our three truck platoon, we had the first truck saving around four and a half percent, second and third truck saving 10 to 15 percent. A lot more experimentation is needed on that under more carefully controlled conditions in order to uh, get some data that we can trust better. Um, since our time is getting kind of short, I think I may skip past most of the technical and institutional challenges to get just to yeah, uh, some of the basic research needs. Uh, there's a lot more in there, but I see we're going to run short of time if I try covering all of those slides. Um, regardless of whether we have an autonomous automated system or a cooperative automated system, there's a lot of work needed on real-time software safety and verification. All of these systems are software intensive. There is no technology right now to prove the safety of a complicated software program. How do you prove that you don't have bugs in the software? And how do you test all of the possible paths that you could go through based on all the different inputs you might receive and all the different relative timing of those inputs? There's a lot of work needed on online fault detection, identification, and accommodation. When something goes wrong, how do we make sure we know it right away? And how do we make sure that we respond to it in a safe way? We have to have zero misdetections or false negatives. If something bad happens, you really can't accept the system where that goes by without being noticed. But at the same time, you have to have near zero false alarms or false positives. And that's really tough to get both zero false negatives and zero false positives. Um, but you have to do really well on that. We have to almost instantly be able to switch to and operate in a degraded mode, a mode where the fault condition doesn't apply. And this needs some work on the general approach, and then it's got to be applied to specific vehicles and system designs. And finally, there's a lot of work needed on the general obstacle detection problems. Uh, 
you have to be able to detect any object that's large enough to cause harm to a vehicle, but at the same time you have to ignore soft targets that are not really hazards. And the example I'd use is a brick in the road in the path of your tire is a really dangerous thing to have if you're driving at high speed. But a brick is not a very easy thing for a sensor to detect. On the other hand, a metalized mylar balloon could be a great target for a radar or a lidar, but it doesn't matter if you hit it. You have to be able to detect the brick and respond to it, and you have to be able to reject the mylar balloon and not slam on your brakes when that's in your path. Uh, institutional issues are another challenge in dealing with this. If we're going to use a separate infrastructure, how can we acquire that so that we can separate the automated vehicles from the hazards? There are a bunch of legal challenges which might need legislation and it might be different from country to country. Uh, how do you allocate liability among multiple organizations when multiple organizations are involved? The driver of the vehicle, the manufacturer of the vehicle, the operator of the roadway, the manufacturer of the subsystem on the vehicle. Who's responsible when something bad happens? What type of certification do you need before you can start operating system publicly. What body has to do what level of testing to show that this is safe enough that it can go on the road? How does an insurance company write an insurance policy when you don't have millions of hours of operating data to be able to say how safe this is? Is this safer than today's driving or is it less safe? And what happens when different countries have different laws and different legal systems but a vehicle manufacturer wants to be able to sell the vehicles internationally they can't design the vehicles differently for different markets when they have different legal systems. And on the commercial side, there's another set of risks. How do you show what the benefits are really going to be before the system gets in service? And how do you know what the costs are going to be in the long term when you get into large-scale production before you have a large number of them on the market? And if you're going to buy something, you want to be sure that that supplier is going to be around years from now to provide product support. How do you make sure that the supplier is still going to be there so the customer is comfortable buying a system that may need maintenance five years or ten years in the future? So with that, I leave you with some of the challenges that still have to be dealt with. And uh, I could take some questions. People have questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Automated, uh, yeah. Of yeah. Is the solution to commuting and transportation, or is it just the wet dream of car manufacturing? I think it is part of the solution. I think it's a big part of the solution. Um, it's not the only solution. And in fact, I would say the primary advocates have not even been the car manufacturers. The car manufacturers have been somewhat hesitant about it. It's been uh, people in research institutes like me who've been really interested in it, maybe even more so than the car manufacturers. Um, in the U.S. environment, we do not have the land development pattern that's amenable to heavy use of public transportation. I assume you're pointing towards use of public transportation rather than automobiles. Um, it works in certain major urban areas where we have high density. Most of our urban areas are very low density. That's not likely to change for a very long time. And we're faced with traffic problems that the existing technologies are really not solving. So I think it's going to be very important contributor to solving those problems. It can mitigate the environmental considerations and the energy use considerations by saving considerable amount of fuel and emissions compared to what you would have without this technology. But it's not going to eliminate those things. It's, it's um, uh, not far from here, of course, we have the Swedish truck manufacturer and car manufacturer, but that's Chinese. For instance, for the Australian market, Volvo produces road transit, which is sort of uh, reducing the gap between the between the trucks to zero. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you actually? And, and I mean, what is the 
benefits to that? What is what, the gas yeah. reduction in doing that? Yeah, there are people studying that as well. Uh, that's an example of something that the public in the U.S would not want to coexist with on the roadway. So that might be a possibility on a dedicated truck lane. It's not going to be acceptable to the public in the mixed highway lanes. So that I think would also depend on getting dedicated truck lanes. Um, when you have to go up and down grades though, there's still a power limitation. <coughs> if you add so much mass behind that truck tractor that it can barely creep up the grade, that's not going to be viable either. So that's not a complete solution. That might be okay if you're on perfectly flat land where you don't have to deal with grades, but once you have to go up grades, the truck performance really suffers. Uh, so there are limits to how many of those you can string together uh, and still get up grades. Uh, other questions? Uh, oops, oops, yes? No, it is a lane keeping system, not just a lane deviation warning, but a system that was actively steering. So the driver was not required to keep their hands on the steering wheel and do the steering. So one can expect that the results may be different in a lane deviation warning system. Oh yeah, I wouldn't expect that problem to exist with a lane deviation warning system because, because you as the driver are still responsible for doing the steering. In fact, I, I, I'm my personal car now uh, has a lane deviation warning system and adaptive cruise control and I use that all the time but I'm still responsible for steering the car. Yeah, so it requires my continual engagement. Um, yes, you had a question? Yeah, I have a more question about the, the port project itself. So we have a lot of different launch projects in the US and in Europe. And is this a university collaboration? Yeah. Or is it companies also involved in this? Yeah, uh, PATH is a university program. We are a part of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, we get research funding from the state of California's Department of Transportation and we get some projects from the Federal Department of Transportation and some projects that we work on with private industry as well. But uh, all of the employees of PATH are employees of the University of California. We're involved in some pieces of that project. We're not uh, we submitted the number two proposal for doing that safety pilot project. Uh, we had a proposal to do it in San Diego, which was not approved, the Ann Arbor proposal one. But uh, we're involved in testing of some of the devices that will be going in there, and we'll be doing some independent studies related to what's being tested in Ann Arbor. Uh, yes? So on short term, long term, Both. Um, I, I don't think uh, you can clearly say one or the other is bigger. I think both are big. Uh, um, well, short term, I would say funding is a challenge. Just getting fun funding to be able to keep making progress on the development of the systems is, is an ongoing challenge. Uh, long term there are both institutional and technical challenges. There are a lot of people in the US who say that the technical problems are all solved and it's just institutional and I strongly disagree with that in fact because of that l list of things that I listed there and several slides that I skipped over that went into a lot more detail on other technical challenges but those are pretty big. Th those are not small challenges. Those are large challenges. Uh, and I think those are going to have to be solved because one thing I guess I didn't mention here that I almost always include in presentations is the current traffic safety statistics in the U.S. show us that fatal crashes happen about once per two million vehicle hours of driving. And injury crashes happen about once for every 50,000 vehicle hours of driving. Here in Sweden, I expect the numbers are considerably larger than that because your traffic safety statistics are much better than ours. Well, think of a very, very sophisticated consumer product that has to do better than that. 
Has anybody ever had a mobile phone that would go 50,000 hours without a dropped call? Or a PC that would go 50,000 hours without crashing? Well, now we're talking about something that's operating out on the road in a nasty environment with vibration and temperature extremes and all the shock and all sorts of other adverse environmental impacts. And it's got to be in the same price range as a PC, more or less. And it's got to work for many, many, many hours without faults. That's why a lot of this needs to be done. Cheap enough to be a consumer product. I mean, people talk about aircraft autopilots and say, sure, you're spending millions of dollars on an aircraft autopilot system and you've got quad redundancy on most of your components and all of that. You can't afford to put that on a passenger car or a bus or a truck. You can't afford to put it on a commercial aircraft, but that's a different environment. An environment with a highly trained, highly skilled, certified operator sitting in the driver's seat, not just any member of the general public who can sit in the driver's seat of a car. And a highly trained maintenance staff that has to be certified and has to follow some very strict preventive maintenance regimens that owners of private cars typically don't do. So doing this in the private car environment is pretty challenging. Uh, yeah? Quick question in relation to funding. Is the equipment cost a significant factor in uh, the expenditure, or is it more uh, the, the, the personnel? Are you talking for the research? Or for, for the research. For the research, it's almost all personnel. Equipment cost is not a very large part of it. Uh, 90-some uh, percent is labor. Yeah. Uh, yes? Explain part of this issue, uh, explain the speed is the most factor, is the most important factor that uh, is used in this kind of uh, communication, wireless communication. What, what about the security of the wireless communication? Yeah, there's a lot of work going into the security of the DSRC, the Dedicated Short Range Communications, that would be the basis for this. Um, that's not my personal expertise, but there are a lot of people spending a lot of time and effort on that. Um, to the extent that what's called the basic safety message in the U.S., sort of equivalent to the cooperative awareness message here in Europe, uh, has been set up so that you've got about 50 bytes of payload, that is the data that describes the actual vehicle operations, with 250 to 300 bytes of security overhead on top of it to deal with all of those security issues. And there's a lot of attention to um, certification, verifying that any entity that's actually sending out data is indeed an authorized uh, sender of data, because there's a lot of worry about either teenage hackers or terrorists trying to get into the system and cause mayhem by sending false data. But yeah, it's getting a lot of attention. Okay. Other questions? Oh, yes. I think it's mostly about software. Uh, I won't say the hardware is completely there because I think there's still a lot of work that should be done on better sensing, but I'd say by far the dominant remaining work is on the software side. And a lot of the hardware advances have been driven by collision warning systems that are improving the sensors and electric and hybrid vehicle technology which has been improving the actuators. So now you can get uh, an electronic steering assist system because electric and hybrid vehicles have that, an electronically controlled transmission, electronic engine control, uh, electronically controlled brakes. So all of those actuator issues that were really very difficult 10 or 15 years ago are easy now because all of that stuff is commercially available. So I think the balance has definitely shifted to where the software is going to need the majority of the work. And I also always point out, this is not the sort of stuff that Moore's Law is going to save us from. It's not just a matter of waiting for processors to get more powerful and memory to get cheaper. Um, some of these challenges are more difficult than that. And they're not going to be solved just by brute force computation. 
Um, we can give you the example of a scenario that inevitably will happen if you've got automated vehicles mixed with other traffic. You encounter a situation where your vehicle is either going to hit a motorcycle and kill the motorcyclist, or it's going to hit a huge truck and severely injure the occupant of the vehicle. What does it do? Who makes that decision? Who writes the code that's going to decide whether you kill the motorcyclist or you severely injure the person in the vehicle? It, there's no answer to that. And yet, if those vehicles are out on the road, that scenario will happen and the vehicle will do something. But how will that decision be made? <laughs> and is that acceptable? Is that acceptable for that to be random? And anyway, yes? So this is really fascinating, the fact that you're saying that uh, there are big challenges in software. Apart from the ethical issues and, and these really difficult situations that have to be addressed, are there uh, general other general classes of problems where the software technology needs to be improved to make this uh, realize this goal? I see that first bullet, real-time software safety. How do you prove that that software is not going to take you into an unsafe state? regardless of whatever inputs it's confronted with. This is so complicated that you cannot possibly do exhaustive testing of all the software paths. And at this point, as far as I know, the technology does not exist to prove that. Um, and yet, if we're going to get to those two million hours mean time between faults, we probably do need some type of solution to that. And again, when something bad happens, when there is a fault, how do we detect it and respond to it appropriately without the driver intervening? Because this happens in a fraction of a second in a way the driver can't be expected to intervene, especially if the driver is texting or doing something else because the system is enabling him to do that. So the system has to be able to handle all of those conditions itself without killing or injuring anybody or killing or injuring many fewer people than get killed or injured today. But again, to get there, you have to have that better than two million mean time, million hours mean time between fatals, or better than that 50,000 hour mean time between injury crashes. Not easy. Uh, yes? That's, that's interesting. Do you think the, in the future you will handshake the responsibility with the system, saying, I, as a system, can't deliver your safety, so I'm, I'm leaving this to you. You have to confirm that because of liable risk. Uh, that there's a lot of discussion going on about that right now. So I don't think there's an answer yet, but that exact discussion is happening at this time. <coughs> People are trying to figure out what would the concept be? How would it operate? And is it realistic to expect a member of the general public to understand the implications of all of that and to understand what it means and to actually follow through on what they said they were going to do? Yeah, yeah, and, and who reads all of those terms and conditions on a website today? But, but now you're dealing with a safety of life issue. You're not just dealing with the personal privacy issue. Uh, uh, it's considerably riskier. So, um, yeah, b plenty of interesting challenges to deal with that. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay thanks. Ple pleased to have the chance to talk to you about this.